Uh, please turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings 5, 20 through 27. Does this sound about the right volume or is it a little soft? Hmm? About right? Yes? Yes, about right. Okay. Seems a little soft to me. But it's hard to tell from up front. Uh, 2 Kings 5, 20 through 27. We'll be looking together at the subject of Gehazi's greed. There'll probably be some familiarity with the story here. Gehazi, who is the assistant or servant of Elisha, is guilty of the sin of greed. He goes dishonestly after the clothing and and uh, silver that Naaman had offered to Elisha. And he lies and steals and bears false witness, swears falsely uh, in the process as one sin leads to another and is compounded. Uh, greed is one of the seven deadly sins, the sin of avarice. The apostle Paul warns, In 1 Timothy 6.10, that the love of money is at the root of all sorts of evil. And the larger problem, however, with Gehazi's greed in this passage is that it obscures the gospel. Uh, The ancient gods of the Middle East were gods that could be bribed and manipulated through gifts. You brought the gift, and by doing so, you you purchased for yourself the assurance, uh, the certainty that the, the god would intervene. In your behalf, it was a form of bribery. Uh, There wasn't any grace involved in it. There wasn't any mercy involved in it. It was uh, just a matter of paying your dues. And when you paid up, then uh, the gods were thought to be propitious towards you. And uh, so Gehazi obscures the gospel because it makes it seem as though Naaman indeed had to pay something. Uh, There was a cost involved in receiving the forgiveness of of his sins and the cleansing from the leprosy. Uh, So it was an evil thing that the Gehazi did, but before we're too hard on him, before we judge him too harshly, uh, we need to remember some things about this Gehazi. Even though the information that we have about him is very sketchy, we are told in chapter 4, verse 12, that he was a servant of Elisha. That somewhat parallels the relationship between Elijah and Elisha because Elisha was a servant of Elijah. They referred to uh, Elijah as your master, chapter 2, verse 3. And so it may be that Elisha was one of the sons of the prophets. In other words, this is a, de- a devout individual. He is, at the very least, a companion of the prophets. And here, the companion and servant of the, the greatest prophet in Israel at that time. That all implies that he was a measure, that there was a, 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 that there, there was a measure of piety, that there was a depth of faith, that he was one who was willing to endure material deprivations and in, endure uh, persecutions and support Elisha. Remember, this is post-Jezebel Israel. This is a very difficult and dangerous environment in which to minister the truth amidst uh, all of the, the idols, uh, the idolatry of Israel, which Elijah and Elisha have been so vigorously combating and denouncing. And so it's likely, in fact, it's, uh, it's unimaginable that the, that the contrary would be true. He's, this is a good and faithful and godly man up to this point. And so what uh, Gehazi is, is he is an example of what can happen to even a devout and pious individual. The Apostle Paul warns in 1 Corinthians ten thirteen, let the one who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You you come into a situation, you're confident of your strength, you're confident that you're beyond reproach and beyond uh, temptation and beyond sin, you're confident of that, that confidence uh, deteriorates into a kind of a self-confidence and self-assurance, and you become careless in the process and let down your guard, let the one who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And Gehazi is just a, a very blatant and tragic example of that. Here he is, the companion, the right-hand man of Elisha, the prophet, one of the great prophets of Scripture, and yet he succumbs to the sin of avarice, uh, to greed or covetousness. 
And what uh, we need to understand as we work our way through this passage is that uh, we are people who are living with a fallen human nature. Even though our, our hearts have been changed and we've been redeemed and born again by the Spirit of God, uh, the old nature remains within us. And life for us is like walking in a room full of gunpowder with a lit match as the means of navigating our way through. Now, that's what our lives are like. At any moment, at any careless moment, should we drop that match? Should we move it uh, in a direction that uh, is off of the the narrow pathway through the kegs of gunpowder, we're, we're in trouble. Now, that's, uh, I, th I think, uh, a fair metaphor for the way that we have to live life. We are like people walking through a room that stores gunpowder, and we're doing so with a match that is already lit and therefore at any moment uh, has the capacity uh, to blow the whole place to pieces. The minute you begin to think that you are safe, the minute you let down your guard, you are in trouble. And that's what happened in the case of Gehazi. That's also what happened in the case of David, king of Israel, in the incident with Bathsheba. That's what happened to Peter, overconfident, as he trails behind Jesus and then folds up uh, under the pressure of the questions of a slave girl. Uh, that's, uh, for that matter, that, uh, that is a way that we might understand what happens to Judas, who, after all, is one of the twelve, one of the disciples, the one entrusted with the finances. Uh, at least at one time, a devout and zealous follower of Jesus, one who was willing to stick, it, stick his neck out and uh, put his life on the line and, and minister in the context of deprivations and persecutions and hostility, and, but who, in the end, succumbs uh, to the temptation uh, to renounce Christ. We have these lists of traitors in the New Testament. For example, in Second Timothy, there is Demas, Alexander the coppersmith, uh, Phygelus, and Hermogenes, who are listed not as outsiders who were betraying the gospel, but as insiders, those who once professed the faith, but who found the... the uh, Requirements of discipleship, too rigorous, found the self-denial too painful, found the persecution uh, too much of a hardship. And so when their guard was down, they succumbed to the temptation uh, to deny Christ and to walk away from him. And there's no shortage of those kinds of examples in our own day. It's not as though our own congregation is immune or our community, the larger Christian community in our, in, our, uh, in our region, is immune. We have examples of men and of women who have walked as disciples of Christ for years, even decades. And then something happens. They let down their guard. Uh, they relax. They become overconfident. Uh, they allow a pattern to... to gain a foothold, a toehold in their heart, in their conscience, in their conduct that gradually erodes uh, their commitment to Christ. And they end up uh, in behavior or activity that is in its effect, in its impact, a denunciation, uh, a renouncing of Christ uh, perhaps overtly, if not overtly, then at least in terms of their actions. So I think that all that we see here in Gehazi's greed. Let's see as we look at verse 20. First, his rationalization. It says in verse 20, but Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, there he is. You see, the servant of Elisha thought, behold, my master, very, very respectful in the way that he, that he even thinks about Elisha. He honors him even in his thoughts has spared this Naaman, the Syrian. There's, uh, there's probably an ethnic slur in that phrase there. Uh, it doesn't say Naaman, the dirty Syrian, but that's probably the, the really the, the sense of it, spared this, this Naaman, the Syrian, no less. 
by not receiving from his hands what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. What's the rationalization going on here? Well, I think at one, on one level, it's, he's thinking, what a waste. Naaman is so rich. He has uh, all of that wealth. He's not going to miss any of that. There's nothing wrong with taking a little bit of that uh, for ourselves. He's just a Syrian afterward, kind of the way we might say, well, he's just, or at least during the Cold War, we would have said, well, he's just a Russian. He's just an Iranian, we might say today. He's just an Islamist or a communist or uh, something uh, like that. And then he's, I'm sure he's rationalizing. Well, and we could use it. He's so rich and we're so poor and we're also always on the run and our lives are constantly at threat because of these wicked kings of Israel and their preference for idolatry. And it's time to spread the wealth around a little bit. And so he rationalizes. That's what's going on at the beginning of verse 20. My master is spared this, this Naaman by not receiving. I'm going to go out there and get some of it. This is, this is ridiculous. This is silly. This is foolish. We could use a little clothes. We could use a little money. We're perhaps starving to death out here. I mean, it's so bad that we spoil a pot of stew and Elisha has to command the heavens and a miracle, perform a miracle so that we have something to eat. We can't just dump it out and start over. That's how thin our provisions are. This is ridiculous. And the point here is that every sin has its plausible explanation. And by plausible, I mean one that makes sense to us at the moment that we determine to commit it. That is true from everyone from Hitler to Hollywood, from genocide to improper entertainment and everything in between. We rationalize. Hitler wanted to create the perfect workers, Germanic workers paradise. He couldn't allow things to get in the way of that. Not when he could bring in heaven on earth. Not when he could bring in a, a utopian society and, and, uh, the world could enjoy the benefits of German genius exercised from the top. We're always rationalizing that we, after all, we really deserve it. Uh, or they deserve it, if it's uh, some kind of a negative sin, and, uh, and in something that we're inflicting upon others, if they deserve what they're getting, or I deserve what I'm after, or I need it, or it won't be missed, they have so much, or they don't really need it, or I had to because, and, and then we fill in the blank with one reason or, or other. And it all seems to us at that moment at least very sensible, very reasonable, very excusable, very understandable. You know, you could throw in some others. This is what everyone else is doing after all. Or one of my favorites, it's not as bad as what the others are doing. Everyone is doing it, but what I'm doing is not nearly as bad as what they're doing. In other words, get a sense of proportion about this. This is just a little thing compared to the, what everyone else is indulging out there. So don't get so worked up about it. Every sin has its plausible explanation, one which makes sense to us at the moment we determine to commit it. And our rationalizations explain our evil thoughts, words, and deeds, the evils that we plan to do and the good that we intend to left leave undone. Uh, do you see that about yourself? Every time we've got a plausible explanation for what we're doing. Uh, we're minimizing the act itself. We're maximizing the pressures on us that make it necessary. We are hurling aspersions in the direction of those who think that our ethical decisions were wrong. We accuse them of being Pharisees or legalists or, heaven forbid, Puritans. Of course, I take that as a badge of honor. But, you know, the world doesn't see that. So we're, we're, we're assaulting those who are against us while we are excusing whatever path that we are determining to take. This all makes perfect sense to, to, to Gehazi. The man's rich. We have nothing. 
Why would, Elisha, why would Elisha not take some of the silver or some of the gold or some of the clothing? A little bit of something. Come on. He won't miss it. He doesn't need it. He's got so much. We have so little. Uh, so he rationalizes his action and provides for us uh, an example of that which we are always doing. We're rationalizing. And in the process, we're letting down our guard. And in the process, we're weakening our own character. We are opening up ourselves to further vulnerabilities and future likelihood of yet another transgression in that direction as we are corrupted by the little white lies and the small things that we rationalize away, we are corrupted by those decisions and make future decisions that are of greater consequence in the future. We make those decisions more likely. So there, there's the rationalization, then the act itself, moving along to verse 21. So Gehazi pursued Naaman, when Naaman saw one coming after him, he came down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me. Is that true? No, it wasn't true. That was a lie. So he's overcome, first of all, by covetousness or greed or avarice, however we wish to analyze it. Now he's, in addition to breaking the Tenth Commandment, he's breaking the ninth commandment. He's bearing false witness against his master. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, just now two young men of the sons of the prophet have come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Now, is that true? There's no evidence that it's true. It's not ever mentioned by Elisha. This seems to be a story he just made up, a plausible story for a plausible sin. Please give me a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. Now, now this, this is, uh, this is very insightful, I think, or provides at least the opportunity for some insight into the, the outlook of Naaman. He doesn't ask for the gold. Remember, there's vast amounts of gold. He doesn't ask for that. There were ten talents of silver that uh, uh, Naaman had brought with him. He only asked for one of those. He had ten changes of clothing. He only asked for two of those. Why didn't he ask for more? Why didn't he ask for a bag of gold as well? That would have gone a long way. That would have uh, lightened the load uh, some for the poor starving sons of the prophets out there in the wilds with Elisha. Uh, how about... Uh, how about uh, Several talents of silver. Why not uh, two or three or four rather than just one? Why not several changes of clothing? Mind you, you know, you didn't run down to uh, the local market to buy your uh, clothing in those days. Clothing was extremely expensive, labor intensive, uh, extremely expensive uh, to get the material, ext ex extremely expensive to make. So changes of clothing represent wealth. He didn't just go down to Target and buy him a suit. Why didn't he ask for more? Well, I think it's all part of the rationalization. He's saying, I'm actually being restrained. I'm being very modest in what I'm requesting. I'm not like a greedy person who would go and, and ask for all that gold and silver. You see, that would, that would be sinful. It's all part of the rationalization. That'd be sinful to go and ask for ten, you know, ten talents of silver and ten changes of clothing and and uh, all of that uh, vast amount of gold uh, that was worth that we saw somewhere between 1.2 and 2.4 million dollars. I'm not a greedy individual. I'm not a covetous individual. I'm not guilty of avarice. I'm not taking more than would be a reasonable amount. Why not? Because I'm an, I'm a righteous individual. I'm uh, I'm a godly individual. I'm pious. I'm I'm a good Christian. Uh, so I'm just asking for what is reasonable and sensible. So I'm, I'm not going to ask for nine changes of clothing. I'm only going to ask for two because that's a reasonable amount. That's a sensible uh, payment by Naaman 
for us poor, starving uh, sons of the prophets. I'm, I'm not going to ask for eight or nine or ten talents of silver. I'm just going to ask for one. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going to touch the gold. Aren't I virtuous? Isn't that interesting? In other words, in, in the midst of the commission of this crime... He is rationalizing and convincing himself of his virtue in not taking more. Like a truly sinful person would do. You see, if he were really wicked, he'd really just plunder Naaman. He's not that. He's just after what really is reasonably there. It's all part of the way in which we rationalize our behavior. It's just a little sin. It's just a reasonable response, a a sensible action on my part. Not anything really bad. I'm not, after all, I'm I'm a believer. I'm not really a bad person. I'm not an idolater like all those people that follow the kings of Israel. I'm not uh, related to Jezebel and all of her uh, sort. I'm not one of those. I worship the true God in the true way. I'm a supporter and helper of Elisha. I am a professor of the true religion. What I'm doing here is not really wrong, and, and the, the, the proof of that is that I'm just taking a very small portion. I'm a virtuous individual as I commit these sins of covetousness and of bearing false witness and of lying, making up a story about my master. Uh, so it's all part of of the self-rationalization and the excusing that so typically goes on with us when we have determined to do what is wrong. This is the way in which he salves his conscience. See, his conscience would have bothered him if he'd done something really bad, like taken it all. That would have bothered him. It's like, a, perhaps, uh, I might go from the sublime to the ridiculous. It's like breaking the speed limit just by five miles an hour. I'm not like those dangerous people who go 20 miles an hour over, and they got little beepers in there, let them, know, let them know when they're on radar. I'm not like those people. I just go a little bit over the, the speed limit. I'm just a slight transgressor. And we actually pat ourselves on the back about that. I'm a virtuous person, right? And I'm not just pointing at you. I'm pointing at me. I'm virtuous. I only go 75 when the limit is 70. Aren't I good? Look at that guy. We'll turn and say as he goes whizzing by us at 90 miles an hour. Look at that guy right there. We pat ourselves on the back. While we uh, continue to drive in complete violation of Romans 13 and... Uh, the apostles' direction to be in, in, in subjection to the governing authorities. We can always excuse it. And, and I think that the lesson really is, you need to know that whenever you or I are deliberating, stepping in a direction that we know is offensive to God, we will find a way to justify it and to convince ourselves, even in the commission of the act, that we're virtuous. Because we're not doing anything like what the really wicked people do when they sin against God. We're not like those heathen and those idolaters. Our sins are committed in the context of virtue, after all. He continues. Verse 23, Naaman said, Be pleased to take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them before him. He even provides Gehazi with servants to help carry off the loot. Uh, Verse 24, when he came to the hill, probably in Samaria, 
He took them from their hand. He doesn't, after all, want us to come walking up with an entourage. Uh, sends them on their way, apparently. And he hides them in the house. Uh, there, he sends them away, and they departed. But he went in. It's hard to exactly figure out what's going on here. But he seems to be, you know, coming in the back door, sticking the stuff in the closet, sending the guys off, coming around uh, through the front door. He stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. Every parent has to love that response. It's, it's midnight. Where have you been? I, I haven't been anywhere. Who are you on the phone with? I haven't been on the phone with anybody. Absolutely irrefutable proof something's wrong, right? Gehazi, this, this is the lamest excuse in the history of the world right here. Where have you been? I mean, come up with something. But I've been nowhere. What did you do? Just vaporize and disappear for a moment? You were talking to no one. You picked up the phone and you talked to the dial tone. Right? Is that, is that what you were, you were talking? You are so lonely that you were talking to the dial tone. I understand completely. I'm sorry. I know life is tough for you. And I give you all of my sympathy. I mean, it is the weakest and the worst excuse. And yet that's what he, he settles upon. Where have you been? H how that makes the guilty tremble. Uh, he knows his number's up. Uh, he knows... As soon as that question is asked, do you think that Elisha asked that every time Gehazi came in the door? Every time he'd been out, where you been? Think he was suspicious, double-checking on where he's been? No, they, this is master, servant, supportive, encouraging. Uh, Gehazi's out serving the interests of uh, the kingdom of God. He comes in. He, they enjoy fellowship with each other. This time when he comes in, it's an accusation. The question and as parents, you need to understand, it is an accusation at times. Sometimes it's just interest information. Tell me where you've been. How did things go? Other times it's an accusation. Where you been? And I reckon that Gehazi caught the tone. He understood the tone of the question. This is an accusation. This is its not quite yet a guilty verdict, but he knows his number is up. He's been caught. He's guilty. And that's why he responds the way we do when we're nervous about answering in a way that is forthright. Where have you been, Gehazi? And he says, your servant went nowhere. This is, a, this is the weakest answer since Adam in the garden. What have you done? I don't want to be asked that question on Judgment Day. I don't want to be asked, what have you done? The answer won't be pretty. I don't want to answer the question, where have you been? Those are very threatening questions that expose our souls. And Gehazi is exposed and he knows it. In the last two verses, we see the judgment that results. And then he said to him, that is, Elisha said to Gehazi, did not my heart go with you? My heart, meaning my awareness of where you were going, my concern about where you were going. In other words, Gehazi, I read your mind. I knew what you were thinking. I saw your eyes when you looked at that vast treasure. And I saw the longing and I saw the look in your eyes that told me that you were thinking Oh, no, don't let it all get away. I could see the covetousness. I could see the yearning to have what Naaman was offering. And when you slipped out, I, my heart went with you. I thought, oh, no, where is he going? What will he do? And I knew what you were after. He knew it either because Elisha was a careful observer of human nature, or he knew it because God gave him prophetic insight. 
Did not my heart go with you when the man turned from his chariot to to meet you? Is it a time to receive money and receive clothes and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? In other words, Gehazi, is this a time to receive gifts? There, There may be such a time. There may be. It may be that there are times when gifts can be received. There's nothing inherently wrong with gifts. There's nothing inherently wrong with uh, the sons of the prophets in their pursuit of the true religion, in defending the the God of Israel and the, the religion that he instituted over against the claim of the idolaters, receiving gifts. That's okay. There's a time to receive gifts. There's nothing wrong with the giving of gifts. There's nothing wrong with the receiving of gifts by the prophets of God. His point was, this was not the time. Not when you have a pagan Syrian who doesn't understand the ways of God and doesn't understand the grace of God and thinks he can bribe his way into God's favor. We didn't want to obscure the gospel. This was not the time. And I tried to explain that to you. And you wouldn't hear. Therefore, verse 27, the leprosy of Naaman shall cleave to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. Perpetual leprosy is God's judgment upon Gehazi. And the, and the irony is, is clear here in contrasting the faith of Naaman, the Syrian pagan, and the unbelief of Gehazi, the servant of Elisha. And what tragic consequences for for Gehazi and his descendants. In a moment of weakness. And that's not unusual. Right? In a moment of weakness, you can destroy your whole family. In a moment of weakness, you can destroy your whole career. In a moment of weakness, you can set in motion that which will destroy your life. And worse yet, may destroy even your soul. A moment of weakness. The decisions you make in this life have consequences. This is, this is you know, we're, we're, we're not playing a game in life. All of this is for real. It all counts forever. And so, in a moment of weakness, in a moment of foolishness, we can set in motion events that will destroy our lives and destroy our souls and have repercussions that ripple through the generations. The descendants of Gehazi will bear the consequences of Gehazi's sin. Is that unusual? Oh, that's that's right there in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 5. The sins of the fathers being visited upon the children. You make a foolish, dishonest, and sinful financial mistake, and your descendants will bear the consequences. You make a sinful and evil moral decision, and your children and your grandchildren will feel the rippling effect of that for generations because of decisions that are made in a moment of weakness.